Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network is a citizen science program that collects long-term data on butterfly populations in Illinois. This presentation, Getting Started with Butterfly Monitoring, is to teach people just starting out about the techniques and procedures that we use to collect our butterfly monitoring data. Since 1987, every summer, people across Illinois have taken their nets and notepads and gone out to a variety of natural areas to collect data about butterflies. Why do this? Why monitor butterflies? Well, it turns out butterflies tend to be fairly sensitive to changes in their environment. And different things that people do can fairly easily displace certain species from areas that they were formerly abundant in. In this, butterflies are good barometers of ecosystem health. The program was started in 1987 by the Nature Conservancy in Illinois. At that time, the Nature Conservancy was overseeing a lot of land management activities. These included things like clearing invasive brush, removing non-native weeds, gathering and scattering seeds of native prairie plants, and reintroducing landscape scale forces like fire. All of these activities had plants as the primary focus of the activities. And so the Nature Conservancy wanted to ask the question, what are these activities doing to the animals on these sites? Butterflies were chosen as a particularly good group for such a study. <clears throat> they have since been used to evaluate the success of various land management activities. In Europe, it's already shown that butterflies can be useful in early detection of some of the effects of climate change. We're just beginning to see some of that here in the United States. Here in Illinois, the Butterfly Monitoring Network, for example, has recorded one species, the fiery skipper, as it has become increasingly more abundant over the past 15 years. Fiery skippers are a species that are normally found further south than Illinois. Finally, many butterfly species are imperiled, and so it's important to keep tabs on how they're doing. The Butterfly Monitoring Network has been a very popular program. When it was founded in 1987, we received data from seven different sites in the Chicago metropolitan area. The network has gone through two major phases of growth since then. In the early 1990s, uh, we grew to over 40 sites, and a second period of growth was encountered about 10 years later. Already in 2013, we have seen signs that we are entering our third period of growth after falling off in numbers for a few years. But this growth is not just limited to Illinois. Across the country, various other networks modeled on the Illinois network are springing up. The two blue states that you see, Illinois and Ohio, both started networks between 1986 and 1996. <clears throat> Illinois modeled theirs after a program in England, and I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Ohio used Illinois as a template to develop their program. In the next 10 years, by about 2006, three other states joined the ranks of butterfly monitoring networks. Florida and Iowa each have their own independent network. As the Illinois network grew, more and more sites started being added near Illinois in northwest Indiana. Indiana still does not exist as a completely independent network. We share data storage and retrieval. We share training. We do a lot together. And so Illinois has gone from a single state program to a two state program. Since 2009, growth has been rather explosive across the country. You can see a number of states here depicted in purple. As of the spring of 2013, the dark purple states have all begun collecting butterfly monitoring data already. States in light purple are still in the planning stages, but are forming new networks. We're very excited to see this national growth of butterfly monitoring. So what we're going to cover on this talk are things that you need to learn to actually become and, and run a butterfly monitoring route. So we'll talk about what's required of butterfly monitors, some of the history of our protocol, how to go about setting up a route on your monitoring site, and then what you actually do when you go out to monitor butterflies. 
We'll talk about our website where we have a lot of additional resources to help you learn more and, and improve your butterfly monitoring and identification techniques. Additionally, our website is where uh, the data submission page is. So in learning about our website, we'll need to learn how to actually submit your data once you've collected it. So, our requirements to go out and monitor butterflies. You sign up for the program through the website, and we'll look at that later in the talk. Once you've signed up, we pair people with natural areas where they will do their monitoring. In general, we discuss with people where they live and how far afield they'd like to go to find a natural area to monitor. This program is restricted to natural areas and restricted to public lands. So places like your backyard are not places that we will make site assignments for butterfly monitoring. Depending on whether it's a site that's been monitored or not, uh, if it's a new site, we will work with you to set up a designated transect route. If it's a site that's already had monitoring done on it, we will provide you a map of your transect route. We require that our monitors attend at least one training session before they begin actually collecting data. And finally, we require that people visit their site at least six times between Memorial Day weekend and the first week of August. Now you can go out more than six times if you want to, and you can also go out before Memorial Day weekend and you can go out after the first week of August, as long as you have six visits between those two dates. We also require that people submit their data to the Butterfly Monitoring Network in a timely manner. This can sometimes be challenging for people. Our protocol is something called a Pollard transect, and this picture depicts a place that looks like it could be somewhere here in northern Illinois in early spring. Uh, but this isn't northern Illinois, this is actually Monk's Wood in Cambridgeshire in England. And in the late 1970s, a lepidopterist named Ernie Pollard used Monk's Wood to develop a technique that he wanted people to be able to use to collect long-term data on changes in butterfly populations. And he wanted this technique to be such that it could be used by people who did not necessarily have a lot of formal training in science. So he developed a technique that involved a walk where one counted butterflies while, was, while one was walking. And this type of technique is sometimes called a Pollard walk or a Pollard transect or a modified Pollard transect. And that is the protocol that we will be using in the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network. Here is an example of Pollard transect. This is my site. This is Bluff Spring Fen. I've been collecting data on this site since 1987. And this is a Google Earth satellite image of Bluff Spring Fen. And you can see in yellow there the route that I walk through the nature preserve while I'm collecting butterflies. Uh, the X that just appeared marks where I start my route. This was not chosen at random. If you look just to the right of the X, that's the parking lot for the Bluff Spring Fen Nature Preserve. So in my case, it makes sense to start my walk right near where I park my car. And I walk the entire yellow line there and end up at the second X here, which is where I stop my route. And so I'm collecting data the whole time I am walking my route and when I get to the second X, I stop collecting data. Now one other thing that you'll notice about this route is that there are three places here that I've shown with these arrows where at some point the route doubles back on itself. So you uh, cross the route going in one direction and then later you cross back over that same section going in the opposite direction. And our convention here is that if your monitoring route has any sections like this, that you collect data only when you are going across this the first time on the outbound leg. When you are returning through this section, you, you pause your data collection when you get to that section. You don't collect any data until you get to where the trail again diverges from where you were before, and then you resume data collection. So on each of these three spots, I collect data while I'm going out, then I loop around, I get back to the same spot, I stop collecting data, and then when I get to the end of the, the doubled section of the route, 
I resume my data collection. Here is an example of the form that we use to record our data on when we are doing the butterfly monitoring work. And we will in a few minutes say quite a bit more about this form and some details about how to go about filling it out. So you have your route and you are ready to go collect data on butterflies. What do you want to do before you go into the field? Because there are certain decisions that you need to make before you begin collecting butterfly data. And the main decisions that you make have to do with, is this a good day to collect butterfly data? So first of all, you don't want to start collecting data before 10 in the morning. And there are a couple of reasons for this. First of all, on many sites here in Illinois in the summertime, if you go out before 10 in the morning, there is going to be very thick dew in the vegetation. This will make it uncomfortable to walk through the vegetation. Your pants will get soaked. But additionally, uh, it's going to suppress the butterflies, and you won't see much flying. Even on days when there aren't heavy dew, however, many species of butterflies don't really start getting active before about 10 in the morning. Yes, you will see butterflies earlier, on, earlier than that, but you won't see a really uh, representative group of species for that site if you go out too early. Similarly, you don't want to be out in the field too late. So you want to be done by 3.30. Now when you set up your route, a typical route should run anywhere from about 45 minutes to just over two hours, depending on the length of the route. So this um, in part is chosen to be a reasonable amount of time to be out collecting data. And in that amount of time of collecting data, um, you can generally over time be uh, getting the kinds of numbers that you need to do statistical analysis with. So any time within that, starting, by 10, uh, sta starting after 10 in the morning and finishing by 3.30 in the afternoon range, you can fit your particular butterfly monitoring route. The weather is also important. First of all, it should be at least 50% sunny no more than 50% cloud cover. Now there are some exceptions to that that we'll talk about in a moment. It also should be warm enough. The temperature, temperature should be at least 70 degrees Fahrenheit. If it's colder than that, butterflies really reduce their flight a lot. And again, you may see a couple of butterflies, but it's really too cold to get a representative look at what's on your site. The wind should be moderate or slower. Well, how do we define this? Not tremendously rigorously. We don't expect people to be out there with wind gauges measuring the actual wind speed. What we want is if you go out and you feel mm, it's a windy day today, it's probably too windy to be monitoring. If, for example, you're on a prairie and you go out and you see the vegetation, the grass of the prairie in pretty much continuous motion in the wind, not just fluttering, but waving back and forth, then it's probably too windy to, moder uh, to monitor. Now, one exception to some of these rules is if it's really warm out. If it's more than 80 degrees out and not actively raining, you can still monitor if it's completely overcast. Now, it, ha it can't be a really heavy overcast. If it's a really dark, leaden sky and looks like it could rain at any moment, then it's not a good time to monitor even if it is warmer than 80 degrees. But there are a lot of days with sort of a high overcast. It's definitely not sunny out. It's definitely cloudy, but it's warm. It's above 80 degrees. You can see lots of butterflies and reasonably good representation of the species on your site um, under those weather conditions. Okay, so you've decided it's a good day, you're at the right time of year, you're at the right time of day, and the weather conditions are right, you're going to monitor. So you're out at your site. The first thing you want to do is to fill out the top section of your data form. And the top section um, should be filled out just before you start walking, and it includes things like your name, the site name, and the date. Your note taker, if you have one, will say more about that in a minute. You want to fill out some simple weather data. Um, the wind conditions and sky are multiple choices, clear, mostly clear, and so on for the wind, calm, relatively still, moderately windy or windy, 
And again, if you would choose windy, you probably shouldn't be monitoring that day. Uh, and the temperature. Uh, and people use a number of methods for determining the temperature. Uh, some people bring little portable thermometers out with them. Uh, some people use the thermometer on the dashboard of their car. Other people make a point of driving past a bank with a digital thermometer. Uh, you can um, make sure you have the weather station on the radio on while you're driving to your monitoring site and pick the temperature that way. Uh, I actually use my smartphone and I just pull up one of the weather apps on my smartphone and get the temperature from my current location. then it is very, very important to record what time you actually start walking your transect. And I'll say a lot more about start and stop times in a minute when we talk about getting consistent data and consistency of data collection methods. So now you've filled out the top of your form, including your start time. Now you're ready to start walking out in the field. You want to walk your route at a fairly constant pace, and you want this to be a slow pace. Uh, you want to be walking slow enough that you can get a good look around you to be seeing and counting butterflies. As you're doing this, you're going to envision yourself as though you're at the center of a big bubble 40 feet in diameter. So 20 feet on either side of you, 20 feet in front of you. 20 feet behind you, although you won't really be looking behind you very much, and 20 feet above you. So it's like this big dome over you. And as you walk, the bubble moves with you. And so butterflies that are on flowers, some of them are going to, as the bubble moves, fall within the bubble. Other butterflies are going to fly into the bubble as you're walking. You want to count all of the butterflies that are within the bubble as you're walking your route. And one of your main goals is going to be consistency. But before we talk about consistency, we're going to talk about where you're going to be filling out your butterfly data. Now, there's a big table at the bottom of the data, data sheet. And the left-hand most column is a list of the butterflies. And we've preloaded that with the species that most people are most likely to encounter. We've left blank spaces for rarer species that only some people are going to encounter, and most people will never see these on their sites. And then the columns just to the right of that, there are five of them, each represent a particular habitat type on your site. So if we go back to the map of the census route for Bluff Spring Fen, here's a little different treatment of it. It's the same route, but what was before just one yellow path is now depicted in five different colors. And each of these colors represents a different habitat type that I encounter as I walk this route collecting my butterfly data. So uh, again, there's the X of where I start my route. And when I start my route, I'm in an oak woodland. That's the first habitat that I encounter. So that becomes habitat A, and it becomes column A on my data sheet. So as I'm walking through this section, all of the butterflies that I'm seeing, I'm recording their numbers in column A. Shortly after I begin, I walk out of the woods at the second X and walk into a wetland. That's the second habitat I encounter at Bluff Spring Fen. And so that becomes habitat B, and I begin recording data in column B of the table. A little bit further on, I go back into the woods again. So now that I'm back in the woods, that is uh, habitat A. So I go back and resume recording data in column A. Uh, for the rest of the time that I'm in the woods there. Eventually, at the fourth X, I come out of the woods again, and now rather than being in a wetland, I'm on dry prairie at that point. So that becomes the third habitat that I encounter at Bluff Spring Fen, Habitat C, and I begin recording data in um, ha uh, column C of my table. And so on as I walk through the site. And there are a total of five habitat types that I encounter at Bluff Spring Fen. So each of your column represents a different habitat type. And although you can designate up to five habitat types on your site, you don't have to use all of them. So for example, some very high quality sites are large prairie, 
where the entire time you're walking your route, you're going to be in prairie. And um, you may be seeing some very rare butterflies on this site, but you will only be recording data in column A on that site, and it will be prairie. And you don't need to worry about any of the uh, other columns. Don't feel that you have to use all of the columns just because they're there. The habitat designations should be set once, and they are set at the time you first do the route mapping. Habitat designations should reflect the following things. Whether that part of your route is shaded or open, whether it is wet, dry, or in between, which is called music, whether the vegetation is predominantly native or non-native, and if the vegetation is predominantly native, is it a remnant or a restoration? So for example, uh, Bluff Spring Fen uh, has never been plowed or farmed and uh, is a uh, remnant. Uh, but if you go to one of these sites that is a former cornfield that was planted with prairie, that's a restoration. And we want to distinguish between the ecology in restored versus remnant prairies. So while you're walking in a particular habitat, enter data into that column, and you switch back and forth between columns as you change habitats. And most people simply make hash marks in the column next to the species that they're counting. And you can see the hash marks here uh, depicted in red uh, on this particular version of the form. And so you walk your entire route, look for butterflies inside of the region that your imaginary bubble covers, and identify and count the butterflies that are within that as you are walking. Record them in the proper column. Now you're done. You've finished your route. There's one more very important thing that you have to do, and that is to record the end time. Now, why are we so concerned about having people record their start and end times? Well, we have to compare a lot of different sites. There are over a hundred different sites that have butterfly monitoring data submitted each year. And some of these are fairly short and you can walk through the entire site in 45 minutes. Others, if you walked at the exact same pace, they're longer routes and it would take you two hours or more to finish your monitoring. How do you compare those sites? Well, what we do is we have to account for the amount of effort that you put in. And somebody who only had to walk 45 minutes doesn't have to put in as much effort monitoring as somebody who has to walk for two hours. And so what we do is we use the amount of time that you are out collecting data as a way to um, correct for, for variations in effort on the different sites. So what we do is we convert your numbers observed to the number of butterflies that were encountered per unit of observation time. And in doing that, we can compare different sites, we can compare different years, we can even compare people who start monitoring and then something happens and they have to abort their route. Uh, those data still become useful at that point as long as they record their stop time when they, when they finish early. So here's an example of a um, census field form filled out the way we would like you to. And you can see up at the top, uh, I filled out all of the, uh, the name and my name and the date. I filled both the start and stop time. The weather information is recorded. There is no note taker at Bluff Spring Fen, so that's left blank. Uh, I have listed the various transect habitats. And finally, I have listed the numbers of each species of butterfly that I've observed. If you look down about three quarters of the way down the list of butterflies, you've see, you will see that on my site we've got some rare species, and on this day I saw one of them, the Baltimore checker spot, so I had to manually write the name of that species into the field form uh, and then record it. So we've said a lot about consistency, and one of the things that we really want to stress is the importance of being as consistent as you possibly can in how you collect your data. So one way to be consistent is to have monitoring be your only task while you are walking your transect. And um, one of the things that we've encountered a few times in the past is <clears throat> 
and people monitoring on fairly modest sites that they should be able to get through their entire route in about an hour. And then they submit a data sheet that records them as having been out counting butterflies for three, four, maybe even five hours. And when we have followed up with these people, uh, they will say things like, well, I was actually out cutting brush that day, and I was, I, I was doing management all day, but I had my data sheet with me, and so while I was cutting brush, if I saw butterflies, I would record them on my data sheet. Well, although that's very nice, you're not monitoring according to the Butterfly Monitoring Network protocol. You're certainly not running a Pollard transect if you were counting butterflies that way. And so your data is completely inconsistent with the data that are submitted by people who are walking a Pollard transect. So while you're monitoring, you should not be um, doing site management. You should not be conducting tours. Uh, none of those things are compatible with butterfly monitoring. While you're out walking your route, that should be the only thing that you're doing. Uh, photography is an issue. Now, we used to say we don't want you uh, doing any photography at all. And since then, we found that on very rare occasion, people see something very, very unusual that were they to complete their monitoring route and then go back to photograph it, in all likelihood, it would not be there anymore. So under those circumstances, people can take a photograph. You want to do it quickly. You want to interrupt your monitoring for the minimum amount of time possible. What we don't want is people identifying their butterflies by photographing most of what they see and then uh, taking it home and doing the identification later from the photographs. You should be doing the identification in the field. Additionally, for new monitors, we would like you not to do any photography at all during your first year of monitoring. The main reason here is that you're not yet familiar with your site, so you don't really have the knowledge base to know what is sufficiently unusual to interrupt your monitoring for the purpose of, of photography. So some more stuff on consistency has to do with the number of people who are out with you, and this is another place that we have had problems in the past. Uh, if you're out with a big group, that's going to produce very different results than if you're out by yourself. Uh, ten people are going to do a couple of things. They're going to reduce the number of butterflies because they're a big group and they're going to scare the butterflies away a little bit more easily. On the other hand, ten people are going to see butterflies a lot more efficiently than one person is. They won't see ten times the number of butterflies that one person will see, but they will see more. So what we ask is that butterfly monitoring parties consist of either one or two people. It's perfectly okay to go out by yourself. But we recognize that a lot of these sites where people do monitoring are fairly remote sites. And a lot of people just feel a greater degree of security if they are out on, this, on these remote sites with somebody else. And we uh, certainly recognize the value in that line of thinking. Uh, but this presents a challenge. How do you compare the amount of monitoring effort between somebody goes, who goes out by themselves and somebody who goes out with a friend? Well, there's some ways to do this. If you go out with a friend, here's how you can be consistent. First of all, the other person should be a trained monitor. So what, what we don't want here is for one person to be the trained monitor and they go out one week with a friend, they go out with their husband the next week, they go out with their mother-in-law the next week. Um, the other person should be assigned the task of going out. So both of these people are a team that go out and monitor every time and both of them should have been through our monitoring training. Then most importantly, only one set of eyes should see the butterflies. So there is a division of labor when two people go out together. One person is the eyes. They spot the butterflies. The second person is the data recorder, what's called the note taker on the field form. So they've got the clipboard and the pen. The first person has either the binoculars or the net, and they're going out and they're seeing the butterflies. The data recorder should follow behind the person seeing the butterflies, and they should record data. So it's the eyes and the hands. Both people can function as the brain. Uh, particularly early on, there may be questions about identification. Both people can participate in uh, trying to identify uh, individuals that you're not quite sure what species you're seeing. 
Most importantly, the note taker should not point out butterflies that the monitor failed to see because that's where the amount of effort varies and effectively at that point you have two sets of eyes rather than one seeing the butterflies. So that's it. That's pretty much how you do the Butterfly Monitoring Network program. Now this is a lot of information and it's easy to feel overwhelmed by this. So we provide a lot of resources through the Butterfly Monitoring Network website. And the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network's website is at www.bfly, that's B-F-L-Y, org. And when you go to that address, this is an image of the home page that comes up. And you can see there are lots of links on the page that provide you with different types of information. And I'd like to just walk you through some of what you can find on our website here. So when you're first signing up to be a monitor, uh, this tells you a little bit about the program and it links you to a form that you can fill out to sign up to become a butterfly monitor. So you really only have to be uh, submitting that particular form once uh, and then we will get in touch with you and we will try to set you up with the site and get you going uh, to be able to start becoming a monitor. Um, this page lists upcoming events and we do a lot of events throughout the years. Particularly in the spring we do a lot of trainings. Uh, in March of every year we do an indoor workshop with guest speakers and identification skill development and you can meet a lot of your fellow butterfly monitors there for um, uh, networking and, and uh, a lot of friendships have developed through the Butterfly Monitoring Network and it's uh, uh, a lot of fun at this event. In the summertime we have an outdoor field workshop where we go out to a site that has lots of good butterflies and work on monitoring skills and identification skills and in many cases get to see species that people have not previously had the opportunity to observe. If you need to get in touch with us question, with questions, uh, this is a link that will get you to uh, email to the people who run the Butterfly Monitoring Network. And then the bottom two links actually lead you to quite a few more resources. Let's look at this one first, Monitor Resources. That takes you to this page, and there's all sorts of stuff that you can access on this page. Guidelines will allow you to download a PDF copy of a document called Guidelines for Monitoring Butterflies. And it's most of the information that uh, you're getting in this particular talk in printed form is in the guidelines. Similarly, as a PDF file, you can download the field form that we've been looking at. Print it off and take it out into the field with you. Uh, we have photo galleries that show pictures that have been taken by a lot of the volunteers in the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network that show the species that we encounter here in Illinois. And these are great ways of supplementing field guides to learn more about identifying the region's butterflies. Supply sources tells you places where you can get stuff. So this leads you to uh, links to sources for butterfly nets links to sources for the kinds of close focusing binoculars that are useful for observing butterflies. There's a list of field guides that we recommend for Illinois and the links there take you right to Amazon.com so you can order field guides if you wish to. Training materials contains a lot of other materials to help you learn more about monitoring and more about butterfly identification. Many of you probably came to this particular presentation through the training materials link. So it leads to a lot of um, guides to identification and we are going to be increasing the number of YouTube talks that we give that help with monitoring and identification here. So this is uh, a section that we hope to be expanding a lot in the near future. And finally, additional resources is a bunch of links to other web resources. Uh, things like the Lepidoptera Society, things like other butterfly monitoring networks in different states around the country. And so these are other resources that you can use to learn more about butterflies and butterfly monitoring. Getting back to our home page, uh, butterfly data is the other really important link and this will allow you to view data, but more importantly than that will allow you to submit your own data. Uh, the butterfly data link takes you to this page. Uh, the view data link 
Uh, every year, while people are submitting data, a running log is kept for the, of the data for that year. And the view data link will take you to that log and allow you to see all of the data that has been submitted already. So uh, now in early 2013, we already have data that have been submitted into the log. And uh, there's not a lot of it, but you could use this link to take a look at it. One thing I'd like to caution people about regarding the log. If you are in a site that you have an endangered or threatened species on, the log is publicly visible. And this is sensitive information. So the log that you see is actually censored. Go ahead, submit this data, but you won't see the endangered species listed on the data form when you access the log. Don't worry, it's in there, we're getting it, and it is going into the main database. Site lists. This is a list of sites that are available and in need of monitors. And so if you are coming just to the network and are wondering what might be available near your house that uh, uh, is in need of a monitor, this is a great place to look. Annual summaries is something that we have created for every single year since 1987 when the Butterfly Monitoring Network was first founded. And there are two summaries that we create each year. One summary lists every species of butterfly that was uh, recorded in the Butterfly Monitoring Network that year. Uh, things like uh, how many sites it was recorded from, a little bit about how many were seen that year, and um, dates of observation. So um, that's based on the species. The second annual summary is based on the site, and we list every single site that has re recorded data that year. We list the number of times the monitor has gone out and run census routes. We list the number of species of butterflies that have been seen on each site. This is the most important link on the page because it's the one that most people will use most often. It's the submit data link. So let's look at how you submit your data to the network. When you access this, you, you go to this page with three buttons on it. If it's the very first time you're using the electronic data submission, you want to start by going to the set defaults. And what this does is it takes you to a form that looks very much like your field form. And you can fill in all of the information that's not going to change from time to time when you go out. So this is things like the name of the site, your name, the note taker's name if you have one, the transect key, the state you're in, if it's Illinois or Indiana. None of those things are going to change from time to time when you go out on your various visits, unlike, say, the weather or how many butterflies you've seen. <clears throat> and then you click Submit at the bottom of the page. And what that does is it means that every time you go to Submit Data, when you bring the form up, all of that information will come up preloaded, and you will save some time by not having to load it every time. Okay, so now you've set your defaults and you've got your data sheet and you're ready to submit your data to the monitoring network. You click on the display form button and that takes you to something that looks like your field form. And if you have set your defaults, things like the site name and the state and your name will already be preloaded in here. So you just pick from menus the uh, date and time information uh, the weather information, you enter the temperature, and then you can see down in the table at the bottom, the species of butterflies are picked from menus, and then you simply type in the numbers of butterflies that you've seen in each of the columns A through E. When you've entered all of that data, you scroll to the bottom of the sheet, there's a submit button, you click on the submit button, and you're done. Your data has gone into the data log at that point. Now one other thing on the data submission page, occasionally people hit the submit button and then realize that they've either not finished entering their data or they've made a mistake or some such thing. That's what the send correction button is for. We ask that people do not simply create an entirely new form at that point, but rather uh, send a correction email describing the error and the correct thing that the form should say and then we will make the correction in the database. So that's it. We uh, ask everybody to uh, have a lot of fun with this, enjoy collecting butterfly, uh, butterfly data, uh, enjoy being out on your sites, and thank you very much for your interest in monitoring butterflies in Illinois.